Hi there, and welcome um, uh, to our next session as we go through the book of Luke, um, the Gospel of Luke even, and we're now on chapter nine. If you've not read chapter nine, maybe take a, a second to just pause the video and have a, have a read through. It's an interesting um, chapter. Um, it's, um, it starts off with Jesus sending out the 12 disciples, giving them authority, um, power and authority to drive out demons, cure diseases, to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Then he says this, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, Leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. So interestingly, what we've seen is Jesus' model of, of how to do mission and ministry. The disciples see Jesus doing it. They see him heal. They see him preach. They see him cast out demons. And um, then they do it. Interestingly, he tells them to, to, to go without all these things that you think they'd need, you know, sort of, you know, if it's, um, if I go anywhere, you know, I normally, well, I normally have a little bag with a few things in it. And um, yeah, I remember when um, Hope was first born, you're thinking she was only a tiny baby and yet the whole car was groaning with, with baby, baby clothes and baby stuff and things, you know, we, we as human beings don't always travel very light. Um, I also think a little bit, um, that so often as I've gone around doing sort of mission and ministry stuff, I realize I've brought a lot of clutter with me. And so often actually we don't just chat to people about Jesus or bless people, we end up having to thinking we need to bring in this course or that technique or do this or do that. And actually sometimes we bring in all this extra stuff because actually we're just not confident that the gospel is enough that the kingdom is enough, that God has equipped, enabled, and empowered us. You see, we often think it's, our, it's down to our resources, it's down to our PowerPoint, it's down to our this, it's down to the, our that. Actually, you know, Jesus is enough. And actually, that idea that people, that, that people actually are interested to hear, you know, actually, there's must be some people who will welcome us and other people who don't, and that's okay. Interestingly, what seems to happen is we often seem to spend our time pushing and working and hanging around people who don't want to hear um, often in resistant churches or churches maybe that are a little bit hard work rather than actually taking our time to engage in the people who are actually hungry to hear more about Jesus the people who maybe don't know Jesus and want to want to want to hear about him I sometimes I think if we could actually prioritize our time better actually wouldn't we see the kingdom of God come more fully in our area the passage moves on now to talk a little bit about, um, about King Herod. And it talks about um, Herod saying about John the Baptist that he'd been put to, that he'd, he'd beheaded him and put him to death. And which is funny because Luke doesn't really tell us much about that. It's just almost a throwaway comment. Yet, you know, we've had two or three, we actually had three big instances of John the Baptist being a major character so far in the narrative and then he just suddenly disappears with a with a throwaway line I guess you know kind of um yeah Luke or whoever it is who's written this is really kind of focusing in on Jesus um but yeah it would have been good to maybe have heard a bit more about um about John and what happened um, interestingly the other gospel writers do include more about John they include the story of um of um, Herodian wanting John the Baptist's head and all that sort of stuff um yes yeah, so we just hear that John's John's died but the um the rumors going around that Elijah has come and um and uh, 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 yeah and um Herod is scared Herod is scared that you know he's he realizes that he's killed a righteous man Anyway, that's a little bit of stuff that's just put in, put in there. I guess also it's sort of um, for um, Luke's readers, he probably put that, that little um, insert there also to help people marker when it happened. Um, again, you know, sort of um, you need to sort of put events in, in, in the timeline so people who are, in, who are researching this can find out when things happen. We then move on to the story of the feeding of the 5,000. But interestingly, the disciples return and um, Jesus is preaching, and they're like thinking, well, these guys are going to be going to be hungry. Um, they tell first of all Jesus to send them away, 
um, or to sort something out. And Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And they say, well, we've only five loaves and two fish. We can't, we can't feed, we can't feed all these, all these people. But um, actually what happens is Jesus does this amazing miracle of, of, um, of multiplying the fish and the loaves. And the miracle actually happens in the disciples' hands. I think one of the things that's interesting is, um, is if I wanted to quote Nanny McPhee, is what is it she says? If you, when people want me but don't need me, I must go. But when you don't want me but you do need me, I must stay. Interestingly, the disciples were able to do the mission and ministry stuff on their own. But yet when they come back to Jesus, they're expecting him to do it for them. And Jesus is saying, no, actually, I've trained you. I've equipped you. You are able to do this. Don't, you know, the problem is so often churches and Christian congregations can disempower people. Jesus is a God who empowers and says, no, you do it. You do it. So obviously this is causing a big, big storm. And this is also, interestingly, an ongoing question that's been rising in the minds of the, of the people. Jesus says to his disciples, who do you say they are? Who do you say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, which is bonkers because they were, they were living concurrently. Others say Elijah and still others, one of the prophets from long ago. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, God's Messiah. Now the version says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. One of those questions that um, I think, you know, you can answer theoretically, hypothetically, but actually for all of us, you've got to answer it personally. <laughs> Who do we say that Jesus is? So it's almost this gradual revelation of, of Jesus' power, Jesus' teaching, Jesus' the prophetic words about Jesus to say he really is God's Messiah, the Christ, the rescue plan. But then suddenly when they realize who he is, suddenly there's another question. This rescue plan doesn't look how they expected it to. This rescue plan is different from what they thought. Jesus then goes on to say about how he's going to be um, rejected, killed, and rise to life. And then he says this, this challenging word, which, which um, is building on the things he said already. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Forever who wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit their soul? The challenge that Jesus is saying is come and follow me, but it's a hard and it's a tough call. It may cost you your life. We then see um, almost the, the um, what's called the transfiguration. We've, we've had Peter realizing who Jesus is, that revelation there. We then see God affirming Jesus as, as, as his Messiah with a, a vision, a, a, a theophany, if you like, of Moses, who is, the, who is almost the embodiment of the law, and Elijah, who's the embodiment of the prophets, and both of whom have their fulfillment in Jesus. They see Jesus not just as a man, they see Jesus, a glimpse Jesus, glorified. Peter at that time gets all a bit sort of confused and talks about building shelters and all that sort of stuff. He even puts in brackets, he didn't know what he was saying. And then, they, then again, they hear the voice of God affirming who Jesus is. This is my son who I've chosen. Listen to him. We then see um, Jesus healing a, um, a, a child of a, well, it says a demon here, but um, what... Um, sounds more like is some sort of epileptic fit whatever it is um, whatever the science is or whatever is actually wrong with the with the guy Jesus was able to heal him and, and restore him yeah again people saw Jesus Jesus healing and then Jesus speaks again about um about his death that's followed by 
the disciples saying, who's the greatest? Who, who, who's the greatest? The guys just, again, it's that, that, that picture that Luke shows, the people who should get it, the people who've been hanging around Jesus, just have, just their mind is just completely on, on other things. Their mind is completely human and, and they're, they're, they're much more about pecking orders and who comes first and all that sort of stuff. And then Jesus takes a little child and says, Whoever welcomes this child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least amongst you is greatest of all. That idea that Jesus' kingdom is an upside down one. Well, it isn't upside down, actually. Jesus' kingdom is the right way up. It's our world and our mindsets that are the wrong way up. We also see the also ends that passage with John saying, we saw someone driving out demons in your name. We tried to stop him because he's not one of us. Don't stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. An idea too often we're very good at drawing lines and having people in or out. And Jesus is saying, well, actually, if they're serving the kingdom, yeah, let's be gracious. Let's be gracious. Let's be inclusive. At the time, um, yeah, then, they, then we, when we see some um, Samaritan villages not rejecting Jesus, and um, James and John wanted to send fire down from heaven and, um, and, and obliterate them. I guess, sort of almost that, that sort of picture of, uh, of, of Sodom happening again. And again, Jesus is like, well, how can you, you get this? Because I've been talking about this so much and yet you're just on such a different mindset. Again, the disciples should really understand what it means to follow God, what it means to live Jesus's way. And yet, we just see time and again, they don't understand what, it, what, what Jesus' messiahship means. They don't understand how to live um, life God's way. Their mindset's about who's greatest and about who's in and who's out. And, 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 smart, and rather than loving enemies, they want to, want to burn them up. It's, you know, again, you almost think, have you guys been listening? But then also I realize that as a Christian, my mindset is often completely warped or, or out of out of sync from what it should be i know what i should think and feel and i know what i do think and feel and i know that too often they're very different things um, we then read a passage that's um, in some of the other other gospels and it, and it talks about someone saying to jesus i will follow you wherever you go jesus says foxes have dens and birds have nests but the son of man has no place to lay his head he said to another man come follow me but he said first let me go and bury my father. Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another one says, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back to my family and say goodbye to them. Jesus said, no one who puts a hand to a plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. These are tough and hard words at the end of this chapter. The whole chapter is a challenge, really. It's a, Jesus is calling people out, out of their comfort zones, out of, out of, out of what they, yeah, into a place of, of, of trusting and a place of vulnerability and a place of challenge. People want to follow Jesus. He's, he's big news. But Jesus is saying it's not an easy call. It's a call that could cost you your life. It's a difficult and a tough call. You know, if you follow Jesus, we need to reinterpret our and unlearn the way we think the world works, our ideas of how it all should happen. Yeah, when, when, we, when we see Jesus saying, well, you come and follow me, but you, you, you'll be homeless. You won't, it won't, you're not going to make any money off it. You're not going to end up with a big house and, 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 and lots of stuff. In fact, actually, you know, bury my father, you know, actually... Now, now is what matters. Now is what matters. It seems really harsh to say that, um, but actually, I don't know. All the all these calls, all these excuses that seem good and seem seem reasonable, but there's always a good excuse. Always a good excuse to not do what Jesus wants us to do. I can always find something that sounds legitimate, but actually, Jesus knows the reality. The truth is, many of us put our hand to the plow and do constantly look back and think, if only I'd done this, I wish I, wish I was like this. 
having that, I remember that when I came back to God, the question I said, I, I had said before is I'd like to find out about God when I'm 40 or 50 and settle down to be boring. That was my exact words. And I think that that's the whole idea of actually, I want to follow Jesus. Well, I want to, I want to get to heaven, but I don't really want to follow Jesus. Or if I do, I want it very much on my terms. And, you know, and carrying the cross was something I was thinking, well, I don't really want to have to do that. I want a comfortable life doing what I want and what's fun rather than actually following Jesus. And actually I realized that, yeah, you know, I didn't really, I couldn't really have Jesus on my terms. I had to have, I had to accept him on his and um, wasn't easy. It hasn't been easy actually, but ultimately that's the only decision we can have really. If we keep on looking back and we're trying to plow a field, our lines are gonna go completely crooked. We've got to focus our eyes on what's ahead and not what's behind. The challenge is if we're prepared to say yes to Jesus, then it's an all-consuming, all-in commitment to him. And that's often tough and hard and challenging. But despite that, I do believe it is still worth it.